everyone has that nostalgic memory of the first time they were introduced to the world of Mario. The tight gameplay, the atmosphere, the absolutely impeccable level design, all of these are hallmarks of the Mario series, and no game showcases this better than Super Mario Bros. 3. Now, this show is all about the little moments and design choices that single-handedly improve the quality of a game. So how the hell am I going to do that when this game is already widely considered to be one of the greatest games of all time? Well, I had to start somewhere, and so now, let's take a look at some of the small work of genius that Nintendo managed to pull off when designing the final world, having a clever source of help disguised as the most intimidating and memorable obstacle on the long, molten road to Bowser's Castle. So, by the time you reach the final world, you think you've seen it all. You've braved the hectic sandstorms of desert land, the confusing mazes of pipe land, and, well, the rampant morbid obesity of America. But finally, after all those struggles, it's time to face your destiny and take on the Dark World. Now, usually how worlds work in Super Mario Bros. 3 is that numbered tiles represent levels. You beat them, they turn into a giant M. But if you get a game over, well, they all reset and have to be beaten again before you can pass. The way the game gets around this is by having special levels such as fortresses, pyramids, and other unique landmarks stay beaten even if you lose all your lives. Usually this will also result in a previously locked door on the map remaining open even after the game over, allowing the player to bypass levels that they have already completed. This in itself is a clever mechanic, punishing players for game overs by having to replay at least some of the levels they've already beaten, but rewarding the player if they have made enough progress to have cleared a fortress. But when it comes to World 8, well, that's where things start to get complicated. You see, the first couple levels in World 8 are symbolized on the map by unique icons, and act like a fortress in that they stay beaten even if you get a game over. This prevents the difficulty level from being too high in those first few levels of the world, while also thematically raising the stakes. These aren't numbered tiles anymore, they're freaking tanks! Eventually, after beating both the tank level, and some weird fleet of wooden boats that's somehow able to stay afloat in a sea of lava, you reach the world's first pipe, and suddenly... Skulls! Fire! Swirling black vortexes! We're in hell! Gotta run! Gotta get away! Ah. ah, crap. Now, that would be most people's initial reaction to having a road of black pits being their only path through the most hellish looking area of the game yet, and with there being a random chance of being dragged into one of those freaky looking levels by a creepy as hell hand, most people will just hope for the best and try to cross without being pulled down. But if they do, they're missing out on Nintendo's bountiful gift to you, the player, in their darkest hour. You see, the levels immediately following this roadway are without a doubt some of the most difficult in the game, to say nothing of Bowser's Castle itself. Chances are, you're going to get at least a couple of game overs during the challenges to come, and more than likely use up most of the items in your inventory. By the time you get back to this road, you're probably feeling defeated, dejected, Worse off than you started now that your supply of raccoon leaves is empty. Or is it? The thing is, Nintendo, with good intentions, has fooled you. By making the pathway into these short levels under the black holes intimidating and, to put it frankly, damn disturbing, they make them look like merely another obstacle to avoid. But when the player starts to think about it, and actually goes to complete the levels, they realize that Nintendo has practically handed three raccoon leaves to them on a silver platter. These levels that the hand pulls you down into are much easier than anything you'll face elsewhere in this world, and give away their spoils with little effort. They ensure that every time you pass through again with a new batch of five lives to burn, at least three of those lives can be empowered with a raccoon leaf. It's little moments like these that prove that Nintendo cares about its players, and the moments that will be the main focus of this series going onward. A world that could become grating, frustrating, and downright unwelcoming only appears as such on the surface. Thanks to brilliant game design, Nintendo never lets you feel like you're outmatched. Nintendo lets you feel powerful enough to save yourself a fine-ass princess, while still keeping the road to her challenging enough to make it worth it. My name's Josh C. Joshua, and that, my friends, was really freaking clever.
The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past, a classic if there ever was one. After a wildly groundbreaking first game and a decent though somewhat odd follow-up, the Zelda series had come to its crossroads with the launch of the Super Nintendo. Would it merely seek to improve on its predecessor's legacy, or would it strive to make its own path? The answer, it seemed, was a mixture of both, perfecting the first game's established formula while introducing series standards such as parallel worlds, multi-tiered dungeons, and of course, the Master Sword. Now, the gameplay? Incredibly polished. The sense of adventure? Unmatched! And the amount of secrets to uncover numbered in the hundreds. But for all its praise, there is one facet of Link to the Past that is often overlooked, and that is its emotional core. So, the game opens with a few ominous messages from Zelda and your uncle before throwing you straight into your adventure. None of those constant tutorials the Skyward Sword delighted in. All you need to know is that the princess is in the castle and she needs saving. The tone is immediately set by the music and rainfall, but reinforced by the way the game subtly pushes you towards the castle. None of these guards can be attacked or passed and just refer to you as kid. It makes you feel weak, small. There's no way directly into the castle, and you eventually find yourself slinking in through a hidden passage under a bush. Not the most glamorous of entrances. And even after you've gotten your sword, that's all you have to defend yourself with. Meanwhile, the palace is swarming with guards of every color, the easiest of which still require two hits to kill. Hell, getting the boomerang halfway through doesn't even help your chances much, considering it merely stuns the enemies. The result of this design is that, although the game is not based around stealth, the player at least has a feeling of dread and a desire to be extra careful while making their way to Zelda's cell. It's interesting to note that the way the castle's basement is designed is deliberately made to be winding and off to the side. It reinforces that feeling of sneaking through enemy territory. Soon enough, you'll have rescued the princess and escaped from the castle, first by sneaking above the soldiers, and then through the dark and desolate sewers. You may be weak, but you sure are resourceful. Then comes the now traditional Zelda structure. Leaving the princess with the kindly old man in the sanctuary, the player now finds themselves tasked with collecting three pendants to awaken the sleeping Master Sword. Over the course of this quest, Link gains a bow and arrow, bombs, and perhaps most impressively, the dashing abilities of the Pegasus Shoes. These allow the player to cross the massive overworld with ease. An overworld, I should add, that mainly contains two major enemies, the green soldiers who, as I mentioned, take two sword hits to defeat, and the blue ones who can take three before succumbing to their pixelated wounds. That doesn't sound like much, but after dashing into groups of soldiers time and time again, the exact amount of hits to defeat each soldier will be ingrained into the player's mind. So, with that subconsciously learned, and with all three bosses defeated, it comes time to retrieve the Master Sword. For the second time in the game, the weather is used to set the mood, an eerie fog covering the entirety of the Lost Woods as you make your way to the sword's pedestal. And then, just when the player is feeling elated, finally having their prize, it all falls apart. A telepathic message from Sasha Rasha Ding Dong suddenly informs the player that the sanctuary is under attack. It's the first time the game is broken from calmly suggesting where you go, and while you still technically can wander around leisurely and continue with side quests, the change in tone emphasizes that the player better hurry up and get to the sanctuary. Alas, no matter how quickly you reach your location, you'll always find the same result. Zelda is gone, the old man gravely wounded just barely able to tell you that Zelda has been taken to the castle before perishing from his injuries. And suddenly, the game's plot and emotions fall into place. For the first time, you're not running because of convenience. You're running to avenge the old man who gave you your first heart container and to finally assault the castle which before seemed impossibly foreboding. The days of sneaking around are over. This time, with the strength of the Master Sword, most of the enemies you've grown accustomed to die after a single blow. And after piercing the wizard's magical barrier, you find yourself in combat with the knights that before you couldn't even attempt to overcome. This return to Hyrule Castle is a masterpiece in manipulating the player's emotions through gameplay, showing them how far they have come since their journey began, and yet, whenever the sudden transportation to the Dark World is revealed, showing just how far you have left to go. The enemies in this new world are more grotesque, have crazier ways to attack, and can take even more damage from the Master Sword. But with that boost in confidence gained from defeating the wizard once, the player is certain that when the time comes, they'll be able to finish the job once and for all. 
So, in the end, does Link to the Past get enough recognition for the way it portrays its story and thus gains the player's attachment? Well, console Zelda titles that followed tended to be more cinematic and thus more direct in their depictions of the legend, and that's a trend that likely won't be slowed down anytime soon. But even with all our high-tech consoles and the promise of more complex storylines in the future, it's important to remember where we began, where the tale of a boy's journey to save the world could be told with only 16-bit sprites, chiptune music, and a whole lot of heart and great game design. My name's Josh C. Joshua, and that is really freaking clever. Ah, uh, the N64 era. A time of innovation, blocky graphics, and eternal classics. Or rather, as I like to call it, the age of the 3D collectathon platformer. Launched by the groundbreaking Super Mario 64 in 1996, and continuing well into the GameCube's lifespan in the mid 2000s, this was a period of colorful mascots hopping around fully realized 3D worlds, hoping to scavenge every star, treasure, and birth certificate that they could get a hold of. Every game developer worth its salt knew they would either have to innovate or die trying, but only one company was able to pull off the genre better than even Nintendo itself. That company was named Rare, and their game was called Banjo-Kazooie. Released in 1998, Banjo-Kazooie improved on the formula established by Mario's most recent adventure in nearly every way possible. A memorable cast of characters, an incredible range of abilities to unlock, and an absolutely perfect soundtrack written by the soon-to-be-famous Grant Kirkhope all helped push Banjo-Kazooie over the top and into the pantheons of impeccable game design. So, what do you do after you've successfully perfected a genre? Well, you develop a sequel, of course, and that's where Banjo-Tooie comes in. Uh, I know we're in the middle of a groove, but can I just butt in for a second? I really, seriously need to know who the hell was the genius that decided to name the sequel Banjo-Tooie? Like, th that wouldn't fly today, but to a kid back then, it, it makes perfect sense. Banjo-Kazooie, then comes Banjo-Tooie, and then... Oh man, I wish there was a Banjo-3. Uh, eh. Anyways, Banjo-Tooie is, in my humble opinion, one of the greatest sequels of all time and a prime example of how to expand a series when it comes time to, well, actually make it a series. The way that Tui improves and escalates above everything that Kazooie laid the foundations for is absolutely mind-blowing, but surprisingly enough, the most impressive part of Banjo-Tooie's design is not in its differences. It is in its similarities to its forefather that a truly special moment is made possible. You see, many game companies, when tasked with developing a sequel to a hit game, are forced to rely on the same engine that the original was built on. This greatly decreases the production time of the new game. Why stop and make a whole new engine when you could just slap a few new effects on the old one and call it a day? And that's what most developers end up doing, trying to hide their reliance on older tech by making little changes to the visuals and game feel, and in the end just causing a disconnect between the two entities that may not entirely be for the better. So what did Rare do? Well, they didn't even try to hide what they were doing, and in doing so, they created something beautiful. Compared side by side, Kazooie and Tui look nearly identical, and some of the pessimists out there might immediately take offense at how much content from Kazooie that Tui reuses. Not just character models and sound bites, but the entire opening areas for both games are nearly identical. But that alone is part of the genius of Banjo Tui. Banjo Kazooie, when taken on its own, was a simple story about Gruntilda the Witch kidnapping Banjo's sister and his classically inspired quest to rescue her. While twisted with Rare's unique brand of humor, the story had this fairy tale like sense of innocence. Banjo and all his friends lived together in this idyllic valley with a mountain, while the main hub of the entire game was the witch's exaggerated and over the top lair. This tale was a compact and easy one. And then comes Banjo Tooie, which blows Kazooie out of the water in terms of scope. It's the same graphics, the same type of music, but it all feels like a more ambitious continuation of the first game. 
all of the moves you collected across Kazooie's multitude of worlds? You already know them all, and you'll need them to become even more powerful while exploring the much vaster worlds of this second game. The fairy tale references are few and far between, and Banjo's sister is nowhere to be found. This time, the entire world is at stake. Hell, the game opens with Gruntilda flat out freaking murdering Bottles the Mole. It all goes to show a much darker and epic adventure awaits you this time around. But what about reusing that same opening area? Well, that's what makes this sequel so impactful. The small changes that were made to Spiral Mountain all show the amount of destruction that Gruntilda's new escapades are causing, and makes the sunny innocence of the first game seem like a distant memory. Even the bridge to Gruntilda's old lair is broken. But, amazingly enough, the developers saw fit to let the player still be able to fly inside and get a small glimpse of the lobby of where they spent so much time in the previous game. The rubble placed everywhere adds to the feeling that if the area were just to be cleaned up a little, you'd still be able to wander through to Mumbo's Mountain or Gobi's Desert. The vast world of both games feels connected. Perhaps the greatest example of this is the cavern through which Gruntilda dug and made her escape. Not present in the original game, but appearing in the familiar landscape and funneling you out into the larger world in which the majority of Banjo-Tooie takes place. It maintains that beautiful charade that the Jinjo village was there all along during your adventures in Banjo-Kazooie. You just didn't have the means to find it. Yes, things certainly were different back during that era. Today, games all have to struggle to set themselves apart, and bursts of creativity and color are few and far between. In an age filled with inspiration and bold design choices of all types, Rare looked back and realized that for once, similarities would have a bigger impact than something new. They built a shared world between games that didn't exist just in two separate cartridges, but within the player's mind. And to a young Canadian boy, that was simply magical. My name's Josh C. Joshua, and that was really freaking clever. For generations, children would entertain themselves with toys, everything from dolls to action figures, representations of anything that was popular in pop culture at the time, and showcasing the limitless potentials of imagination. It didn't matter how G.I. Joe was facing off against Buzz Lightyear, because in a child's mind, anything was possible. As time went on, however, children's playthings evolved to include video games as well, and suddenly Nintendo came out of nowhere and wowed the world with a game that not only included the all-star roster that only their company could provide, but a brand new style of fighting game that has yet to be rivaled. Super Smash Bros. arrived with a bang, and with its brilliant game design, made every single player from complete newcomer to seasoned pro have a great time. You see, the fighting game genre originated with arcades. Huge machines with impeccably crafted joysticks, buttons placed in exactly the right places for each individual game. These fighters were designed to be loved by the professionals, and to devour the quarters of those who dared to just be casual players. You were expected to either master these games, or merely stare in awe at those who had memorized each title's intricacies. And while there are definitely some notable exceptions to the rule, fighters generally didn't hold up to their arcade counterparts when ported to early 90s consoles such as the Super Nintendo or Genesis. Sure, they were good, but they were always just a shallower experience than what you could get in an arcade. By the time the Nintendo 64 arrived, practically every 2D fighter was just a reskinned Street Fighter clone. The problem wasn't just that every fighting game had such similar mechanics, it was that these mechanics weren't always that easy to understand. Complicated sequences of buttons can only get you so far. Now, if there's one thing besides great game design that Nintendo is known for, it's trying new things and attempting innovation. And while it can be argued that sometimes the company doesn't always succeed, this was an occasion where Nintendo absolutely nailed it. With Super Smash Bros, they unveiled an entirely new fighting engine based on completely different principles than any mainstream fighter before it. Gone were the days of quarter turns and complicated Hydukins. With standard directional attacks on one button, and special attacks for each character tied to another, this was a system that anyone could pick up and play. Add in dodging, shields, and grabbing, and each character was made flexible to control without becoming overwhelming. 
This, however, is only the tip of the iceberg. The majority of fighting games, hell, even most games in general, rely on a health system. You have a bar that indicates how much more of a beating you can take before you lose. Smash Bros. decided to be entirely different, however, with their stamina system. The only way to beat your opponent in this game is by having them knocked off the stage. Whether that means simply falling off the edge or getting launched into the stratosphere is up to you. The percentages for each player's damage can theoretically be infinite, but the higher your number is, the easier it is to send you flying. Generally, you'll reach around 100% before you really need to worry about it. At a glance, this doesn't seem like a huge difference from other fighters. You're still just trying to deal damage and then finish with a hard-hitting move, right? Well, the genius in this design is in its uncertainty. You don't know exactly how much damage is enough to seal the deal. Whenever both players are nearing the 200s, you face one of gaming's most intense moments. It's a variable that keeps the game interesting from growing stale or becoming too obvious. Throw in some Mario Kart style items along with the moving battlefields and you have a confrontation between players that is ever changing and can have the weakest link triumph over the strongest foe. It is evident in every facet of Smash Bros. design that the game was built around enticing casual players, and in that regard, it definitely succeeds. But what's more is that the game systems are deep enough for professionals to enjoy and grow skilled at, turning the game into a sport. And that is completely fine. For those that enjoy playing no items, Final Destination, all the power to ya. That's the beauty of Super Smash Bros. The game can be enjoyed in hundreds of ways by someone of any skill level. There is no right way to play it. And for Nintendo to have pulled that off is simply incredible. I'm going to end this episode on a bit of a personal note. At the start of last September, the beginning of my first year at college, we set up a Nintendo Wii in the lounge of our dorm. Inside is a copy of Super Smash Bros. Brawl that, to my knowledge, has only ever been removed for an occasional round of Mario Kart. Since the start of this school year, the students of this dorm have allotted over 200 hours to Smash Bros. And not just the same group of us over and over, that, I guess that'd be expected. There are literally dozens of profiles made for this game by now. Everyone wants to try this at least once. Everyone wants to know what all the fuss is about. And everyone has had a good time. And to have made a game like that, well, that's really freaking clever. Every once in a while, something magical happens in the gaming community. An idea will take shape and grow far beyond the typical limitations of the industry. The game is no longer just a game, but an icon, a sensation, a genuine masterpiece. It's happened with Pokemon, it's happened with World of Warcraft, and now it's happened with Minecraft. And the best part? This excitement shows no signs of slowing down. The thing about Minecraft that brings such a good feeling to heart, besides the whole being an amazing indie developer success story, is the possibilities it gives the players. Every day you can find new stories of the mind-blowing structures and worlds that its players have built, each tale more awe-inspiring than the last. Within Minecraft lies tools of creation, entirely new means of artistic expression. But that's a topic that honestly has already been pretty well explored. What most people seem to overlook, however, is the actual game design that all of Minecraft's survival mode is built around. It is here where things start to get particularly interesting. Now, when I talk about the survival mode, it'd be easy to go for the obvious. Everyone who's played Minecraft knows that anxious rush of looking for your first deposit of coal, or the realization that you probably shouldn't have waited until the sun was half set to begin building your 30-story summer villa. And, of course, by now we all just accept that, oh my god, creeper in the house, is labeled in the thesaurus as a synonym for pants-shitting terror. But I'm not talking about the horror and survival aspects. What I'm talking about is the sense of adventure. Minecraft can theoretically handle worlds that are infinite in size, and when you have an open-world game that vast, you do run into some problems. The great thing about voxels and randomly generated worlds is that there's always something new to experience, some unexplored area to go no matter how long you play the game. But eventually, after you've had hundreds of players working on a single world for months, you begin to reach a limit. Not a technical one, 
but a convenience-related one. How do you go to visit a player-created city when it would take literally hours and dozens of in-game days to walk there? Well, the short and easy answer would be to teleport there. But we need to remember, teleportation is only in the game either because of mods or as a script command on multiplayer servers. Technically, it could just be considered an admin or debug tool. From a game design standpoint, how do you solve the problem of a world perhaps becoming too big while still falling within the logic of the game? Because, you see, one of the main design pillars of Minecraft seems to be that you need to, well, mine and craft everything to progress. And that progression can be slow going. So, the advantage of quicker travel would have to be earned, right? What would our options be then? Minecarts? They're a faster means of getting around, yeah, but only really useful for traveling downwards quickly. Going across larger distances would use up a ton of resources, which isn't really something deliberately earned, more just a side effect of digging deeper and deeper. Boats? Uh, these are great for early game travel across water, but are really situational in that respect. Besides, chopping down a tree isn't exactly earning your travel. So, what's left? Collecting obsidian and creating a portal? Yeah, that'll do the trick. And this'll take me right to that far off location I want to get to, right? Right? Most people's immediate reaction to discovering the Nether is fear. A place that looks literally like hell, filled with some of the most powerful enemies in the game, with no silly things like sunlight to aid you, the Nether still gives me the creeps. Many people, when first discovering it, will be confused. That's your reward for successfully harvesting enough obsidian to make a portal? An even more difficult and terrifying world to worry about? Well, now for a little bit of trivia that many people seem to have forgotten, having gotten used to teleportation and admin commands. The Nether acts as a hellish highway when compared to the regular Minecraft setting. For every block you travel in the Nether, you will have moved 8 blocks in the real world. Creating another portal 100 blocks away from your entrance to the Nether will lead you back 800 blocks from where you began. And suddenly, it all begins to make sense. Instead of taking the lazy way out and merely creating instant portals, the developers of Minecraft created a system of risk and reward. If you want to get someplace faster, you're going to have to brave the bowels of hell to get there. But, as it is with anything in Minecraft, it's a system that you'll slowly better and craft improvements for over time. What may start out as a mad dash through lava-soaked territory will eventually become a well-polished and well-defended highway to your faraway destination. That's one of the greatest things about this system. It's up to you to take full advantage of it. It keeps the player from feeling too cozy and relying on means of instant travel, sucking the fun and adventure out of the game once they've progressed enough. It retains the game's ability to make you feel like you're traveling a great distance, having a full-fledged journey, instead of any location just being a button press away. In an industry that seems obsessed with streamlining and automating everything, Minecraft stands out by keeping the adventure and exploration in gaming. My name's Josh C. Joshua, and that, my friends, is really freaking clever. Before the adventure of Banjo-Kazooie, before the revolution of Goldeneye, before the vastly underrated genius that I hope to someday review on this show of Jet Force Gemini, Rareware was best known for one thing, the Donkey Kong Country Trilogy. Now, the first game? A pretty solid platformer that happened to have absolutely stellar graphics. The sequel? Nothing less than one of the greatest platformers of all time. It improved on the original in every single way fleshed out the art style, gave way more depth to the world, and held it all together with level design that has yet to be topped. So what happens when you try to expand onto a game that already has it all? Well, let me introduce you to the brilliant madness of Donkey Kong Country 3. Now, as I said, Donkey Kong Country 2 is widely regarded to be the best of the trilogy. And the original usually gets a lot of praise for starting the series and for the nostalgia factor. Practically everybody seemed to own that game in the late 90s. Given its older siblings' acclaim, it's kind of startling how little you hear about this third game. 
Hell, even Donkey Kong 64 gets more praise, and that's usually seen as the worst defender of the collectathon genre. And even when people do talk about Country 3, it's usually complaints along the lines of, Who the heck is Kitty Kong? And, It's all just a load of gimmicks. Now, while I can't really explain Rare's thoughts process on this thing, I can defend their choice when it comes to the game's level. Let me reiterate once again, Donkey Kong Country 2 has practically flawless level design, and trying to follow that up directly was bound to cause disappointment. It's a problem that all trilogies with great second installments have to face. How do you subvert expectations and avoid falling prey to Ewoks, Bane, or... Ugh. Rare was under a deadline to release in the Super Nintendo's short remaining lifespan, and had little time to try and revolutionize the genre all over again. So, they did the only thing they could, take the assets they had, and go completely crazy with them. Don't believe me? Let's take a look at the game's first two worlds. Most games, they start off with the basics, easing you into the nuances and neat little tricks you'll need to master over the course of the game. Donkey Kong Country 3 starts off like that, and has a fairly average opening level in the new setting of the Northern Cremosphere. And, well, there's nothing really too fancy to see here. Then, you have this second level in a warehouse, with levers hanging from the ceiling that need to be pulled to open time doors. You'd assume that this is a mechanic being introduced, though it'll be essential and developed more later on, right? Well, no, these levers are isolated to only this world. Alright, that's odd, but let's move on. Another level, an ice level, a horror gimmick, a boss made out of... Wait a minute. A horror gimmick? Yeah, for the last level of the first world, the game randomly introduces a mechanic where the elephant transformation is scared of the rat enemies when they walk into lit areas. This mechanic is then never used again. Why? Because rareware, that's why. The second world of the game then stops any pretenses of being an average platformer. Every single level has something unique a mechanic or gimmick that is never used again. Barrel shields, rat-powered doors, bouncing spiders, and arranging barrels as floating platforms. There's even a level with both a swarm of invincible bugs and a timer to race a bear's fastest run. Two completely independent gimmicks in the same level. It's absolutely ridiculous! But honestly, that's where the game gets its charm. Few games can match the sheer variety of situations that Donkey Kong Country 3 throws at you, and none can really match up to the quality of each gimmick. Rare takes mechanics that could easily support entire worlds of any other platformer, and cuts it down to only its best parts, creating levels that are memorable and unique. When someone mentions Giant Sawblade when discussing this game, you automatically know exactly which level they're talking about. Sure, Donkey Kong Country 2 has equally memorable levels as well, but not in such great numbers. Added with the fact that Rare added side quests involving bears and banana birds, along with an actual world map to explore, and Donkey Kong Country 3 is filled to the brim with content and personality. This is the game that happens when you fill a room with some of the industry's best level designers and tell them to go completely nuts. And amazingly enough, it works. So, does Donkey Kong Country 3 live up to the hype set by its predecessors? No, not really. But then again, how could it? It all depends on perspective. Rare could have easily tried to copy their formula from the previous two games and make a quick buck before moving on to the Nintendo 64. But instead, they had some fun with the franchise and ensured that the Super Nintendo went out with a bang. It may not be the best Donkey Kong game, but... For the reasons I've said above, it just may be my favorite, and that willingness to experiment and create the world's most varied 2D platformer, well, that was really freaking clever. There are only a few things that gamers can ever be sure of. That Link will always get the Triforce of Courage, that Kratos will always find someone to stab, that EA will always nickel and dime the hell out of any franchise it can. These certainties, while not always good, let gamers feel comfortable, secure in their lifestyle. One of these reassuring expectancies used to be that every Nintendo system will always launch with a Mario platformer. It was just a given. 
But then, in 2001, Nintendo shocked the world by holding off on their long-awaited sequel to Mario 64, and instead launching the GameCube with a game unlike anything we'd ever seen before, Luigi's Mansion. At first, gamers were outraged. Sure, they'd always wanted a game starring Luigi that didn't involve memorizing, ugh, geography, but using such an odd experiment to launch a new console? What was Nintendo thinking? Well, maybe they were thinking more than the rest of us, because as it turns out, maybe Nintendo launched the GameCube with the true sequel to Mario 64 after all. Now, Luigi's Mansion has a pretty unique premise for a game, although it very obviously does take a bit of inspiration from outside sources. But a game taking place inside a haunted mansion that isn't a horror game, or feature any real fear elements? It's not a platformer, it's not quite a puzzle game, and although the combat system is genius, more on that later, it's not quite an action game either. This game defies any existing genre. It can only really be described as an adventure, as an experience, as... fun! So, Nintendo kicked off their newest console with something entirely new. When you start the game, Luigi is the only character that players would already know. The ghosts are all new creations, seemingly having abandoned the old Boo designs, and then there's this guy, Professor Egad. Judging from the fact that Flood from Mario Sunshine was also made by this freaky little dude, it's obvious that Nintendo was working on expanding their universe, trying new things, innovating if you will. When you buy a new console, your gut reaction may be that you just want to see all your favorite characters in better graphics, but in reality, we need more than just new hardware for a change in console generations. We need new ideas as well. That's not to say that Nintendo abandoned their established franchise, though. As the game progresses, Luigi is reunited with Toad and begins to encounter more familiar Mario enemies such as Shy Guy Ghosts and, of course, the classic Boos, who are conspiring to get revenge against the Mario Brothers. The payoff to all of these connections to the previous games is, of course, the final boss, in which the player has to face off against the spitting image of Bowser, controlled by the devious King Boo. This was a point in time when Nintendo knew just the right amount of build-up and precision required for nostalgia to be the most effective, instead of relying on it entirely as they could theoretically be accused of doing today. Indeed, the most fondly remembered parts of Luigi's Mansion are the things that stood out as being unique, though still soaked in Nintendo's trademark flair. The combat system is without a doubt pure genius. Besides the most basic ghouls, each enemy has some small quirk to make revealing their hearts more difficult. Once you've overcome this, however, the combat turns into a game of ectoplasmic fishing, a back and forth battle of wills that remains just as engaging by the end of the game as it was when you first began your journey. The portrait ghosts are the finest example of this, each one showcasing a unique full room puzzle to solve to unveil their hearts before some of the toughest tug of war in the game that will require both the control stick and the C stick to be slammed to achieve victory. So, it seems we have a game that shows off the technical strengths of a new console's hardware and controller, along with a soothing mixture of both old and new to ease us into the possibilities of a new generation. Sound familiar? Well, let's just say that maybe it's not a coincidence that there's such an emphasis on paintings with mysterious properties in this game, or even the eyebrow-raising setting of a large building with multiple floors that are blocked off until a boss battle is won. Yes, I am fully willing to state that Luigi's Mansion is the closest thing to a Super Mario 64 sequel that we'll ever get. True, games such as Sunshine and Galaxy have continued to refine the Mario platforming formula, but they also seem to deviate slightly from some of the mystery that the original 3D platformer had. There was a sense of exploration, of trying new things, that is hard to sum up in words. Luigi's Mansion took this sense of adventure, of wondering what lies just around the bend, and built an entire game upon it. So, what specific part of Luigi's Mansion do I call out for being really freaking clever? In this case, it's not quite as clear-cut. The game mechanics are tight, the story and characters are filled with cartoony charm, and the presentation is phenomenal. But all in all, it's the new ideas that make Luigi's Mansion so great. The thrill of turning on your GameCube for the first time and experiencing the same curiosity as Luigi as you venture through a dark and dastardly world, it's a feeling you can't get anywhere else. A launch title should not only make a player feel invested in that game, it should make them excited for all the possibilities to come. 
And the fact that we were able to have both the new and the old in such a spectacular way, well, that is just really freaking clever. Aw, uh, yeah, it's Kirby! You know, the round pink dude with the appetite of a vacuum cleaner? Now, these days, it's easy to just nonchalantly include Kirby in the pantheon of cute Nintendo characters. I mean, sure, he's great at annoying people in Smash Bros, and Nintendo likes to throw him around when experimenting with new types of gameplay, but there's not really that much more to him, right? Well, if we really want to figure out what's so special about Kirby, we need to go back and examine his first console appearance and the game that first defined the series, Kirby's Adventure. Now, gaming back during the NES days was quite a different beast than it is today. Very few games chose to take advantage of the battery-powered memory that the NES was capable of, and thus were still stuck in the arcade mentality of game design. Without saving, games had to remain short enough so that they could be completed end-to-end -end in a single sitting. But, if they were so compact, how was a game to maintain a player's attention and make them feel that they had truly gotten their money's worth? Well, the primary tactic used by developers was by making their games have a high level of difficulty. Games such as Contra, Castlevania, and the Japanese version of Super Mario Bros. 2 are well known to test even the most skilled gamers' abilities. The main focus of their design was memorization and having the players make repeated efforts to overcome the obstacles in their path. The original Castlevania had only six levels, but when was the last time you heard of someone just breezing through that? The game is filled with cleverly placed enemies, patterns to recognize, and some of the most difficult jumps in platforming history. Just getting from one side of a room to the other is a challenge in itself. So where does Kirby's Adventure come into all of this? Well, at first glance, nothing seems that special about the game. Heck, the Super Nintendo had even launched, and this was still on the regular NES. It was just a colorful world, catchy music, just another platformer, right? Yeah, so Kirby's Adventure happens to include the ability to fly. Not hovering, not double jumping, actual unlimited flight in a platformer. And to make the ability even more overpowered, coming at a flight mode automatically kills any enemy in front of you, clearing the way for you to immediately resume your ascent. You would think that because of this huge shakeup to the inherent rules of the platforming genre, that the entire game would be ruined, but somehow, Nintendo makes it work. Instead of focusing the game on memory and skill, Nintendo made Kirby's Adventure about, well, the adventure. When it comes down to it, the game isn't all that difficult. The ability to simply inflate yourself and float over most obstacles, combined with being able to suck up most enemies in one try, means that there's usually not too much stress placed upon the player. The challenges, when they do appear, are few and far between, paced just right to keep the player on their toes. To complement this more laid-back design, the game is fresh, colorful, and playful. The worlds are all cheekily named after food, and alongside the regular levels, are filled to the brim with assorted minigames and museum rooms, which ensure you can eventually unlock access to your favorite copy abilities whenever you want. Speaking of which, the copying mechanic syncs rather well with the whimsical, carefree nature of the game that the Endless Flight reinforces. Having enemies able to be defeated so easily just by sucking them up makes the copy abilities less about upgrading Kirby and more about changing up your playstyle just enough to keep things interesting. The fun comes not from just overcoming your foes, it comes from taking them out in the funnest way you can. Furthermore, being able to save your progress and continually work towards the goal of traversing Dreamland over a longer period meant you could take your time with the game, experiment with the different abilities, master the timing of the minigame at the end of each stage, suck the hats off these guys, they don't care! People may try and dismiss Kirby's Adventure for being released two years after the SNES on an outdated console, but that's not the market Nintendo was going for with this title. A game such as this is a perfect gateway into the hobby. It's not strenuous, it doesn't require great skill, but it still manages to be loads of fun. A more casual player may not have enough of an interest in gaming to buy a brand new SNES, but a secondhand NES was a less risky buy. And with a game like Kirby's Adventure doing its best to lure in players of all sorts, perhaps Nintendo converted some into hardcore fans after all. 
You know, I can remember playing Kirby's Adventure at my grandparents' house. I can remember the excitement of getting one of the rarer copy abilities, the lame jokes made at the expense of Wispy Woods, and the rush of beating a platformer on my own for the very first time. These moments, these fond memories, those are the things that really matter. In a time such as this, with the industry in the middle of such an upheaval, and new consoles on the horizon, some looking grand and some, well, not so grand, it's important to remember the emotions that games can invoke. The reason that we care enough about a hobby to write about, to rant about, to make blue-tinted YouTube videos about it. Everyone kickstarts their gaming career somewhere, and with Kirby's Adventure, Nintendo made a near-perfect entry point. It might not be the greatest, it might not be the most well-known, but this game knew how to draw in new players. And that, my friends, is really freaking clever. It was something unlike anything the world had seen before. A pop culture sensation that not only took a generation by storm, but allowed them to take part in the adventure as well. Originally launching on the Game Boy in 1998, the Pokemon series soon grew to include a cartoon, trading cards, and every other type of merchandising deal you can imagine. As the franchise rapidly grew, fans began to make higher demands of the series. They wanted to play out these famous Pokemon battles the way that the cartoons depicted them, not held back by the primitive handhelds the games were designed on. And so, in 1999, Nintendo released Pokemon Stadium, ensuring that the Pokemon craze would never be the same. Now, the original Pokemon games, they're something special, and are actually the first real example of the social gaming craze that's sweeping the industry today. No, I don't mean to compare Pokemon to Farmville, but the games are a great example of connecting players in an era where it was hard to do so beyond split-screen multiplayer. The Pokemon games were deliberately designed to have their players interact with one another. The internet was still mostly restricted to PC gaming, and so connecting all had to be done in person, through link cables. Pokemon had this brilliant slogan, Gotta Catch em All, a challenge to its millions of potential players. It was a journey that you were all on together, that you'd need to aid each other in to ever succeed, and the two versions of the game really drove this home. Some Pokemon would only be available in one version of the game, and some could actually only be evolved through being given to someone else. Trading was the only way you could ever hope to complete your collection. Furthermore, what's noteworthy is the battling aspect of the series. Once you had your perfect team lined up, you grew attached to them, proud of them. You wanted to show your Pokemon off to the world, to compete with others. The entire lore of the series was built around becoming the best Pokemon trainer there was, and the gameplay, well it let you live this fantasy out. With such solid foundations, Nintendo and Game Freak had a huge hit on their hands. Sequels have followed the same general formula as the original Red and Blue, each handing out a new generation of Pokemon and expanding on the connectivity options available to players. But, throughout it all, all of the main entries in the series have only been available on handhelds, and to many people, that's considered a problem. When Pokemon Stadium was finally released, people liked it, but also seemed disappointed that we didn't get a true 3D Pokemon adventure. Well, I'm here today to talk about how that might not necessarily be a bad thing. Let's say, for example, that instead of developing Pokemon Gold and Silver for the Game Boy Color, Game Freak instead made the sequels for the Nintendo 64. Well, I guess just make that sequel. With no internet or LAN capabilities, the N64 was isolated much like any home console was until the rise of Xbox Live, and without any way to trade Pokemon and keep some specific to each version, there's no point to producing two separate titles. Some may say that that was just a greedy business practice anyways, but I've always felt it adds to the uniqueness of the series, giving you that discussion and investigation about which version has the Pokemon you'd prefer, and how to compensate for the Pokemon you can't quite as easily get. So, already, this Pokemon, uh, Golver has lost some of its charm. Being unable to connect with its peers in any way, the N64 version would hinder many aspects that makes the Pokemon series so special. No trading, no special events you can attend to get legendary Pokemon, and no comparing collections with friends. I mean, sure, you still could have the core mechanics of getting gym badges and pursuing the Elite Four, but without any significant challenge to catching them all, or a way to show off to your peers, what's the point? 
the game would always just have been a shallower version of the handheld games. Luckily, there was one benefit to a home console Pokemon, and that was the thing that Nintendo decided to build the entire Pokemon Stadium game around. Fully realized 3D battles. The Game Boys were only capable of producing non-moving sprites that occasionally jiggled the screen and, uh, made lines. Compared to that, the graphics of the N64 practically looked like the Sistine Chapel. Attacks were finely well animated, and the beauty of seeing all of your favorite collectible monsters just as they looked on TV made many a childhood dream come true. And the best part? All of these Pokemon were actually yours. Every copy of Pokemon Stadium came with a transfer pack, which allowed you to directly connect your copy of Pokemon Red or Blue and see your very own team come to life on your television. But a game has to offer more than just graphics, right? Thankfully, Pokemon Stadium is more than just a battle simulator. There are multiple tournaments to compete in, and even an abridged version of all the gym battles in Red and Blue. This ensures that even if someone buys the game without previously owning any of the handheld titles, there is still a sense of progression, even though you're technically just renting the Pokemon in this case. There are trophies to unlock, shiny Pokemon to face, and even some simple Mario Party-esque minigames to partake in. Though, admittedly, they were a lot more entertaining when I was younger. Ever since that original release of Pokemon Stadium, times have changed quite a bit. Hundreds of new Pokemon have joined the series, featuring new types, new forms of evolution, and entire new worlds to explore. And with the technology available in modern consoles, perhaps a fleshed out Pokemon title you can enjoy at home is now a possibility. But there will always be a special place in our hearts for Pokemon Stadium. A game that took the creatures that we loved and let us enjoy them in a whole new way. Over a decade before Skylanders, Nintendo realized the appeal of taking a beloved toy and bringing it to life in your living room. Pokemon Stadium elevated the series beyond just a handheld sensation and ensured that we'll still be trying to catch them all for many years to come. And that, well, that's just really freaking clever. Wow, I got through an entire Pokemon-themed episode without going out of my way to troll all the Pokemon fans out there. Good job, Josh. Digimon was the better show! Ever since the launch of Super Mario Bros. in 1985, game companies have been constantly trying to outdo one another when it comes to establishing their own platformer series. As gamers, we've been exposed to Italian plumbers, blast-processed hedgehogs, and everything in between as developers seek out the formula for a perfect platformer. Although they all technically belong to the same genre, platformers can differ widely when it comes to how they feel, simply based on how the games are designed. Mario is known for power-ups, Sonic's got that whole speed thing down, and Donkey Kong, well, hey, he rolls! There's only one feature that all of these games have in common, and that would be something that's existed just about as long as video games themselves. Game Overs. For a while, developers felt that punishing players for their inability to overcome challenges was the best way to extend a game's length and focus a player's attention. But what if a platformer decided to defy this given standard of gaming and instead crafted an experience that constantly drove the player forward, giving them the incentive to never give up, to never have to backtrack, to never stop having fun? Well, straight from the mind of two indie geniuses, I give you the modern classic of Super Meat Boy. Strap yourselves in, ladies and gentlemen. This episode will not be vegan friendly. So, Super Meat Boy is one of the greatest success stories in indie gaming and is well deserving of all its praises. It's a high-speed platformer complete with wall jumping, deadly traps, and a killer soundtrack. The game is loosely tied together with the humorous tale of Meat Boy pursuing the evil Dr. Fetus, and its levels are generally pretty short, collected in batches of 20 to make up the game's worlds. Pretty basic for a platformer at a first glance. Well, here's the thing. Super Meat Boy manages to be one of the most absurdly difficult games of all time without ever feeling unfair. You see, fairness is always a tricky balance in games, especially ones that have you consistently hopping over pits of lava and other such nonsense. A difficult game is separated from a broken one by one simple factor, control. A player has to always feel like they are in perfect command of their avatar and should be able to develop an understanding of their own limitations and abilities in the game over time. This is one of the main reasons that Super Mario Bros. has become so popular. 
With the Mario series, Nintendo managed to strike gold with their platforming engine on the very first try. They realized that the best level design in the world couldn't save them if Mario controlled badly. Want an example of how important this type of game feel is? Try asking a Genesis era fan what their opinion is on Sonic the Hedgehog 4. The best thing about this game design truth, however, is something that Team Meat realized early on. There is no single perfect way for a platformer to handle. Could you imagine trying to play DuckTales with Castlevania's method of jumping, or vice versa? Being able to face off against Dracula while bouncing all over the place would completely destroy the experience. The two types of character movement both work flawlessly in their own games, but would be absolutely terrible in others. The perfect platformer would be a game that has a well-controlled character in a world designed around that character's limitations. So, Team Meat took the ricocheting, high-flying fun of their protagonist and built the entire game around it. It didn't matter how nefarious the level design got, you always had complete control of Meat Boy, and you could generally always see how to succeed in a level from the moment you first entered it. The only problem you had to overcome was actually accomplishing that feat. So, as I said, this game is tough. Really tough. And the fact of the matter is, anyone who plays Super Meat Boy is going to die literally hundreds of times in the game before they complete it. Team Meat needed to come up with a system more elegant than Game Over's. Many games in recent years have begun to abandon this concept of limited lives already, and simply relied on checkpoints, leaving any games that retained Game Over's to feel, well, dated. In most games, dying only took up a few seconds of your time before throwing you back to somewhere close to where you failed. You got a few beeps and boops, a sad little jingle, and then you were sent right back into the fray. When you finally lost all of your lives, that was when you had a longer moment of respite, whether it be on a menu or a countdown screen. However, this mechanic didn't really have the most positive impact on players. Sure, it gave you a moment to catch your breath, to get your act together before trying again, but it could also be a depressing and almost off-putting experience. Please try again? Why should I if I'm performing so badly? The game seemed to be asking you if you were finally ready to give up, which admittedly does provide some incentive in a masochistic way, but isn't really everyone's cup of tea. Super Meat Boy, however, already has more than enough masochism to spare. The game is daunting in both its difficulty and the sheer amount of content that it packs in. There's secret characters to unlock, warp zones to uncover, and an even more difficult dark world to overcome after you've mastered the original levels, adding even more craziness to the game. It would be easy for a player to simply bow out and stop playing the game because how are they ever going to beat it all? Well, the genius of Super Meat Boy is that it never really gives you a chance to feel down about your odds of success. You have unlimited lives, and every time you die, you immediately spawn right back at the beginning of the level. The music doesn't stop, and the paths you've taken before are still marked with Meat Boy's red goo, a dark reminder of which paths to the goal you've attempted before. You're constantly encouraged to keep going, even after dozens and dozens of deaths on a single level. You may be wondering, what's so special about this? I already mentioned that game overs have become less common over the years, but Meat Boy did something different. They realized that they could utilize this brief period of rest that game overs provided and place it somewhere else to reinforce victory instead of failure. Because when you finally do beat a level in Super Meat Boy, you're treated to a visual masterpiece. All of your previous attempts of the level are played at once, giving you an immense emotional payoff as you finally get some respite from the game's constant action. You watch as one by one, your Meat Boys fail while others pass them by, until finally, only one remains. Your perfect run of the level, the payoff to all of your attempts. The game rewards you for your perseverance instead of mocking you for your failures. It's a feeling that gives you a sense of accomplishment and makes you want to continue to overcome the game's challenges, so that you can experience that rush once more. There are many words you can use to ultimately describe Super Meat Boy. Insane, hard, overwhelming even. But the one word you can never use is impossible. No challenge you face is insurmountable. No bandage is placed somewhere it can't be found. Eventually, with enough effort and commitment, you can beat this game. The genius that Team Meat managed to pull off was in keeping you wanting to push forward, to find out what challenges lay just around the bend. For a game this crazy to keep you this committed, well, that's really freaking clever. Let me make something entirely clear right off the bat. 
Mario Kart 64 is freaking legendary. Nintendo's third home console is well known for having tons of split-screen standouts, but when it came to chaotic four-player fun, few games could compare to this 1997 classic. There was nothing better than sitting down with some friends and enjoying the insanity of Banana Peels, Rainbow Road, and Red Shells Galore. When played with a group, Mario Kart 64 was the genre at its best. But when it came to the single-player offering, the game suffered from the same problem as its predecessor. All gamers could really look forward to was the same old Grand Prix events with rubber banding AI. It certainly wasn't bad, per se, but compared to the fun of multiplayer, this part of the game fell a little flat. So, a question arose. Was it possible to make a kart racer just as engaging in single-player as it was in multiplayer? Well, as they often did, Rareware decided to answer this call head-on, and barely a year after Mario Kart wowed the world, they released Diddy Kong Racing, a game that combined adventure and driving in ways that have yet to be topped. So, I don't want to spend too much time talking about Mario Kart, but some comparisons do have to be made to show just how much Diddy Kong Racing diverted from the genre. By now, the kart racing formula has been firmly established. A multitude of colorful mascots race through vibrant levels, utilizing shortcuts and randomized items to get ahead of their opponents. Mario Kart deliberately decided to put having fun ahead of game balance. Sure, three blue shells in a row isn't exactly fair, but hey, it's hilarious! Because of this, Mario Kart's design has to rely on other players to keep its random factor from becoming too annoying. A friend who constantly is in possession of golden mushrooms is a lot easier to deal with than a computer player that can't hear your taunts or creative swears. Rareware realized that pure randomness wouldn't work with Diddy Kong Racing, and thus the first thing they set out to do was bring a tactical edge to the world of kart racing. Now, no one's going to compare Diddy Kong Racing to Gran Turismo, because at the end of the day, the differences between each character are just the usual staples of light, medium, and heavy. But where the game gets interesting is not how it deals with characters, but how it deals with items. You see, unlike Mario Kart, in which your odds of getting a particular item are determined by your current standing in the race, and where all of the boxes can hold any item, Diddy Kong Racing's system is much more structured. Items are held in balloons of a specific color, which always spawn in the same place and always contain the same item. Red gives you missiles, blue gives you a boost, green gives you an oil slick, and so on and so forth. Since the items are consistent in their placement throughout each level, this means a higher value is placed on learning the track and anticipating the best maneuvers. Adding on to this system even more is the inclusion of a power-up system. If you hit a balloon while already carrying that balloon's item, your arsenal is leveled up. With three ranks to each power-up, your boosts get bigger, your slimes become deadlier, and your missiles transform themselves into an entire armory. This may seem like only a small alteration to the Mario Kart formula, but it entirely changes the way you approach a race. Instead of just trying to nail your drifts and hope for the best when it comes to items, you have specific choices to make. Do I try launching my missile now and hope I can line up the perfect shot, or do I wait until I can upgrade to a homing missile right around the corner? Do I grab the green balloon and try to slime the guy right behind me, or get the blue balloon instead simply so that he doesn't get the extra boost if he gets it? Suddenly, the game has a much more tactical edge, and feels a lot more fair. Games with friends are less about random chaos and more about the competition. Likewise, being able to plan and coordinate your approach to the races means that facing against the computer is less a game of chance and more of a challenge to overcome with time. This alone would have made Diddy Kong Racing single player more enjoyable, but Rare decided to go the extra mile. There is no Grand Prix in this game. Instead, you're dumped into a Super Mario 64 style hub world, tasked with collecting golden balloons and operating much like any other collectathon game. Instead of just going from track to track, you have to unlock each level and complete multiple challenges, which cover everything from normal races and coin collections to a battle mode and time trials. Many of these were already featured modes in other racers, but the mere act of combining them all into one cohesive experience makes a world of difference. With the consistency and connection between all of the game's features, you are more likely to have an investment in the game that no other kart racer could provide. One of the things that drives us to complete games is a sense of progression, the feeling that we've made an impact. 
As you explored the island, you could visibly see more doors open up, more secrets to uncover, and more ways to experience the game. Heck, I haven't even touched on the fact that you could also use a hovercraft and a plane. This game is just oozing with variety and content, and it's all contained within a single mode. Adventure is a word I use a lot in these videos. Not just because it means a lot to me, but because I think it means a lot to all gamers. Within every single video game, no matter what genre, there's a story to be told. And a lot of the time, it's one we have to tell ourselves. In all fairness, Diddy Kong Racing's framing device is rather simple. Giant pig is evil, giant pig chases animals, hey, here's an island to explore and connect the races. But by both creating a seamless world instead of just a menu screen and a list of achievements, by putting an emphasis on the gameplay over sheer spontaneity, Rareware made this game feel like a journey that could stand up to the best of both racers and collectathons alike. Mario Kart may make you feel good about your friends, but Diddy Kong Racing makes you feel good about yourself. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is really freaking clever. When it comes to franchises that have stood the test of time, Castlevania stands proud of the best of them. Although the series would eventually evolve into a saga of Metroid-style games with heavy RPG elements, many gamers remember Castlevania for the tense and linear platforming of the originals. The Castlevania trilogy on the Nintendo Entertainment System prided itself on offering a heavy challenge to all who dared to face its horrors. The games were a massive success, and after each installment had already put their own spin on the basic jumping and whipping gameplay, what was a fourth game to do but to expand on that jumping and whipping? Super Castlevania 4 arrived only months after the launch of the Super Nintendo, and perhaps more than any other game, showed off the potential that a new system could bring to an old series. Not including the old Ataris and such, the NES was the first console that really took off and launched the entire concept of gaming at home. So when it came time for the SNES, developers were confused as to how they were going to continue over their existing series onto this new console. No one had really had to deal with a next generation before. Of course, after the launch, Super Mario World was hailed as an instant classic, expanding on everything that had made the previous games great with shiny new graphics to boot. Given Nintendo's obvious advantage in having developed the game along with the hardware, developers were curious. Was the game a success because of its new mechanics, or because of the extra graphical capabilities of this new console? In response, some companies merely slapped the word Super in front of their older titles, gave them a new coat of paint, and shoved them out the door. Others decided to continue developing for the NES, waiting until they had the right ideas to blow minds down the road. These were both seen as relatively safe options during the era. Konami, however, had something else in mind. Now, the Castlevania series was always about more than just blasting through the game. Even with such primitive graphics and sound, the original game had a thick sense of atmosphere, enforced by the deliberate gameplay limitations. Your jumps were rigid, your whip was slow, and you had to constantly be aware of your surroundings. There was practically zero room for error. It wasn't a horror game by any means, but that feeling of dread was still there. Because of the NES's limitations, all of these emotions had to be invoked, through gameplay alone. When bringing the series to the Super Nintendo, Konami realized they had a bit more leeway in terms of how to inflict that same experience upon the player. With the much more powerful architecture of the Super Nintendo, the designers could finally give Dracula's castle and its inhabitants the visual design they deserved. Sprites could be larger, more detailed, and utilize technology that wasn't previously available. Compared to the previous entries, Super Castlevania 4 was much larger in scope, and since the gameplay was no longer the sole provider of the narrative and horror elements, that allowed Konami to broaden the appeal of their gameplay. As I said, in Castlevania 1, Simon was a character with many limitations in how he could move. Many of the enemies, meanwhile, were much faster and had much more erratic movements than Simon was capable of, and generally operated as complex as the NES could handle. With the SNES's improvements, however, enemies could do all kinds of crazy things, like break apart, jump around, and be much larger than before. Since the enemies had been made more mobile, Simon could also be brought up to speed as well. 
Thus, Super Castlevania IV saw the introduction of being able to change your momentum in mid-air and whipping in any direction. This was changing the two core mechanics of the series, but without sacrificing the game feel that these mechanics had enforced. The game industry was changing and becoming more popular by the second, and Super Castlevania IV may be one of the first examples of a series changing to become more accessible. Compared to its older siblings, the game isn't near as difficult, instead offering a much more forgiving experience. The key thing to take from the design of this game is that visuals aren't the only thing that can be upgraded with a new console generation. If the gameplay systems don't progress as well, then what's the point? Some would say it's best to keep gameplay and graphics separate as two distinct art forms. But gaming is so much more than that. Gaming is all these visual and audio masterpieces combined with a design that complements the both of them so that they all form a cohesive experience and one we can remember. Super Castlevania IV chose to let the graphics carry some of the weight when it came to the horrors of Dracula's castle instead of just the control scheme. And to have made a game to become more accessible without giving up its charm? Well, something like that is really freaking clever. Hey there, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the like button, be sure to hit the subscribe button, and leave a comment down below, because apparently that helps the algorithm. Also, if you want to support the show and get your name in the credits, check out my Patreon. Love you guys!